If you have your Bibles, before we pray, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 12. We're studying the life of Abraham. So Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to begin reading at verse 10. Okay, and we're going to finish out the chapter here. So Genesis chapter 12, beginning at verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. And when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you're a woman beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. I'm going to read a few more verses here in case we get to this part. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. Okay? So keep your Bibles open. Please bow your heart and your head with me. And let's ask the Holy Spirit to do some miracles tonight. I was so, I get so excited. You know, I saw Peggy say she's excited to be here to learn. Um, uh, I, I think it was, um, I forget who said it, but somebody else said, we're ready to get into the word of God and to be refreshed. I think that was Tim, if I'm not mistaken, right? And it's so exciting. It's so exciting because we do end up refreshed. This is what we need, right? We don't need a pep talk. We don't need emotional hype. We need God's word. So, Lord, we come before you this evening and we thank you that you've poured out your living word upon us. Thank you, Jesus, that you are in heaven at the right hand of the Father, that you are even now praying for us. You're praying for our time together in the word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are right with us. Lord, as we study this book of Genesis that was written so many thousands of years ago and yet is timeless because it's your word, we need your mind, your Holy Spirit, to illuminate it for us, to light it up, to show us what we need to see. God, I pray for a mighty outpouring of your Holy Spirit. I know this is, I, I don't want to say just the Bible study, but this, this is not a revival service per se. And yet, every time we approach your word, we should come with highest expectations. So I'm asking you to do a mighty work and to revive our hearts in Jesus' name, we thank you so much for your presence with us. Amen. All right, here we go. Let's dig right in. So we left off. Uh, Abram going through the land of Canaan, right? He was called by God out of Ur, went up to Haran, then he headed toward the Canaan land. And uh, there was a famine in the land, the Bible says. There was a famine in the Canaan land. We talked all about this last week. So if you weren't with us, get on YouTube and ca catch it. But here's the bottom line. Because there was a famine in the land of Canaan, Abram, there's no evidence in the Bible that God told him to go. But Abram decided to venture down to Egypt. Now, as we discussed, Egypt in the Bible is always a type of the world. Abram probably should not have gone down to Egypt, even though there was a famine. He probably should have trusted the Lord to provide, but he went. And because he was headed the wrong direction and away from God's plan and will, he ended up in a grave sin. So let's watch this. 
they're going down to Egypt and Abram says to his wife, Sarai, who actually was his half sister. But you know, the technical department and I, we were talking about this today. Yes, we talked about half lies or half truths or whole lies. And especially in this case, because for Abram to say, uh, tell them you're my sister, that would make them believe that she is not his wife which gave Pharaoh free reign to take her into his harem. So not only was this a whole lie, it was a dangerous lie. So the father of our faith, Abram, the man who will see not far from now, I have his son Isaac as a promise from God, take him up a mountain and be willing to sacrifice his son for God. That same man, the father of our faith, finds himself faltering in his faith, living in fear, lying, and asking Sarai to lie. All right? Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. How many of you out there, though, you are wonderful people of God? You are wonderful Christians, wonderful people. How many of you would call yourself a person of faith? I would. Okay? And so... All of us people of faith, we're perfect, right? <laughs> we, we would never tell a lie. We would never lack faith. We would never have fear, right? Junior technical department's over here saying, no way, no. <laughs> yeah, we know that we do. And we see that Abraham, I love this about the Bible, it's very real, it's very raw. He was afraid, and he said that to his wife. Now, Norman Geisler, okay, Norman Geisler, who's a great apologist, Christian apologist, said this, whatever weaknesses they may have had, the biblical authors are universally presented in scripture as scrupulously honest. And this lends credibility to their claims. For the Bible is not shy to admit the failures of God's people. Now you want to talk about failures. We're talking about Abraham telling a lie here. He's actually putting his wife at risk. But let's just think of a few characters. My favorite, my man, Petey, right? Peter the disciple. How many of you know what he did? Remember? He denied Jesus to a little servant girl even. Cursed and swore that he didn't even know the Lord Jesus. We think about the failure of Peter. We think about all the disciples on the other hand because the Bible tells us in the text of the Bible it actually says that upon Jesus' crucifixion, what happened? When he was arrested and crucified, it says all the disciples what? They fled. They ran. You, you think of another key, uh, key people that have failed. You talk about Moses that we're going to study later on. I mean, Moses, the one who brought us the Ten Commandments, how many of you know that Moses was a murderer? You realize that out of his frustration and not fully understanding his calling, he once murdered an Egyptian. And that haunted him for a long time. And of course, you know, everybody always loves it. We talk about David. David, Jesus chooses to call himself the son of David. The Bible says in the Old and New Testament that David is a man after God's own heart. And yet... David, in his sin, committed adultery with Bathsheba and arranged to have her husband killed. Seems very strange, doesn't it? We serve such an awesome God. But I want to tell you, you know what, how Christianity is different from every other religion? Christianity is the only religion. I know it's not really a religion. It's a relationship with God. But it's the only religion that says God is altogether 100% infinitely holy and man is 100% altogether infinitely sinful. There's nothing good in us. God, us, an infinite distance. And so when we look at the Bible, it's very real about the sins of even the greatest. So I want to share with you a quote that I came up with as evidence for the Bible that many of you ended up liking on Facebook. Now, this is really important, so I want you to digest this and think about this as we talk about Abraham. Ready? If the Bible were of human origin, if, if only humans had written it, one would think the writers would make themselves and the heroes of the religion look good. Right? 
If the Bible was of human origin and the Holy Spirit wasn't really behind it, then you would think that the people who were writing about themselves would write good of themselves. By excluding their major flaws and failures and highlighting only their strengths and victories. Hey, that sounds like social media, doesn't it? People only want to put all the good and amazing stuff about themselves and we forget about the flaws and failures, right? That, that's, I, I never thought of that until I was just speaking this to you. That's how we know the Bible is not of human origin, right? Because that's what people do. Yet, being of divine origin, the Holy Spirit includes the good and the bad about the major characters of the Bible. God shows us the truth of human nature and the need for a Savior. Why? Because the purpose of the Bible is not to falsely make humans look good, but to drive inherently sinful humans to Jesus Christ, the Savior, who takes away our sin and prepares us for the only perfect place, which is heaven, right? God didn't write this book to make us feel good about ourselves in and of ourselves. He wrote this book to make us know our need of a Savior and to make us know of the availability of the Savior to drive us to him. And so one of the greatest evidences, other than fulfilled scripture, the eternal unity of the Bible, the archaeological evidence, is just, just the fact that the Bible is so brutally honest. It shows that it is God, it is the Holy Spirit behind the Bible who is telling the writers what to write. Because in their own humanists, they want to exalt themselves, but the Holy Spirit in them is driving them to exalt Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen on that? And let that be our guiding principle on social media or out having conversations with people that we should not be exalting ourselves but exalting the Savior. Right? Okay. So, Abram says to his wife, say you are my sister. So, not only is Abram lying, but what is he doing? He, as the spiritual head of his house, which a man is supposed to be, is now asking his wife to sin. Wow. John Phillips, I remember I shared this with you last week. I love what he said. What a selfish, despicable request. It's a wonder Sarai ever spoke to him again. There is no knowing how low a saint will sink once he gets out of touch with his God. Because in doing this, Abram was asking her to lie, but that wasn't the worst of it. Abram knew that he was wanting to be known as her sister rather than her husband so that they wouldn't want to kill him. But in doing so, Pharaoh would be able to take Sarai into his harem. So Abram's not only asking her to lie, he's putting her in jeopardy, sending her possibly to Pharaoh's home to have sexual relationship with Pharaoh and become one of his wives. Think about that. Abraham. He said, do this that my life may be spared for your sake. Isn't that interesting how he couches it in her good? I wrote, notice how Abram couches his sin and the sin he's asking Sarai to commit in the veneer of being for Sarah's good. Even though sin is never in the best interest of anyone right when you are sinning it is never in the best interest of anyone verses 14 and 15 when abram entered egypt the egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful and when the princes of pharaoh saw her they praised her to pharaoh and the woman was taken into pharaoh's house so this is what i was just speaking to you about because of the lie, and again, he lied because he was afraid that the Egyptians would kill him to have his wife. Because if he's married to her, they got to get rid of him to have his wife. So he's lying out of what? Fear. He's down in Egypt out of fear. God called him to Canaan. He didn't stay in Canaan thinking, there's a famine. How's God going to provide for me? How many of you know that God can provide for you in famine? 
How many of you learned that God can provide for you during a pandemic? How many of you know that God can provide for you in sickness? Amen? God can provide. So this is all out of fear. And I'm going to tell you, my greatest besetting sin, the sin that I struggle the most with is the sin of worry. I don't know how many, and that's a true confession. And I'm not, I'm not proud of that at all. I struggle and confess that before the Lord and I battle that. But I'm going to tell you something. Fear will take you a lot of places you don't want to go. So, yeah, I, I'm getting, you know, I told you, I get the thumbs up from the technical department. Sometimes I get the hearts. And right now I'm getting the fist pump like this. I'm getting that from both sides of the technical department. I don't know what that means. Amen. amen. That's, oh, that's amen. I'm sorry. Amen, sister. That's amen. <laughs> okay. John MacArthur, here's what he said. This statement is loaded with significance because it implies that Abram did nothing to prevent it. Abram had effectively allowed another man to take his wife. I just, I can't even imagine this. I can't ima imagine what Sarah's thinking. With the intention of making her part of his harem, fear had driven Abram so far from being a man of faith that he had sold out his own wife. And I know many of you, like me, we, we can testify, we can think back to our past sins, and you can think of many, many types of sins that you commit. You not only sell out yourself, you sell out your testimony before the Lord, and you sell out tons of people around you. Because as the saying goes, no man or woman or child or teenager ever sins alone. You think you're alone. You think you've hidden it. You think it's not going to affect anybody else. It always does. All right, it always does. Verse 16, so for her sake, Pharaoh felt he dealt well with Abram. You see, Pharaoh was excited. He doesn't think that Sarai is Abram's wife. He thinks it's a, her sister. So he's like, oh, you know, you're going to, will you let me have your sister? You know, and it, oh, sure I will, you know, Abram says. So Pharaoh's like, oh, well, she's beautiful. Thank you. And he starts to treat Abram well. And so he had sheep, oxen, all kinds of uh, animals, donkeys, servants, camels, right? In the New Living Translation, I like how it says it here. It's easier to understand. Then Pharaoh gave Abram many gifts because of her. <laughs> okay? Now, here's, where, here's what I want to point out. When you first commit sin, do you always get your hands slapped? Does it always feel horrible when you sin? Sometimes in our conscience at first, but you can harden yourself to that. But what I'm saying is the actual act. I mean, okay, let, uh, what, what sin should I choose? I hate to pick any sin in particular. I choose gluttony, okay? How many of you have ever been gluttonous? I think that was me today. I think I did that today. But anyway, uh, when we commit, for example, the sin of gluttony, when we stuff into our physical self more than is necessary, we hurt the temple of God, all right? Does it feel horrible at the time that you're committing gluttony? No, but later on it will. And even months and years down the road it may. And I'm just using a simple one as an example to let you know. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that the, the pleasures of sin uh, are, they're there. They're temporary. Sin is pleasing for a while, for a season, right? So at first things didn't go haywire when Abram committed this sin, as a matter of fact, as the devil would love it to be, Abram sinned and started feeling good about what he got as a result. How about that? How about that? The devil wants you to feel happy in your sin. Okay, let's, let's, let's watch this. Hebrews 11.25 in the King James Version. It says of uh, Moses... He chose to leave Egypt, even though he was a higher up in Egypt, and he knew he was a Hebrew. The Bible says he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the what? Pleasures of sin for a season. Sin may feel good for a while. Have you ever felt good when you sin? You do something? Yeah, it, for a while, you can feel good. Henry Morris, it often seems at first that a compromise, watch this, a compromise, that's the key word, maybe even not an outright rebellion, but a compromise 
between the methods of the world and God's will and promises works out very well. Following the criteria of the practical world system will often prove profitable because of the pragmatic nature of that system. I want to tell you something. The devil is the prince of the power of the air. The devil is the one behind the culture. Do you understand that? So pop culture, all these, you know, the collective celebrities of the world and, and all the commercials you see on television and all the eye candy you see at the stores you go to and all of the lust of the flesh that you're tempted, all of the, you got to have the latest of this, the greatest of that. You got to follow the world system. You got to indulge your flesh, indulge everything that your mouth wants, everything that your body wants, everything that your eyes want to see. That whole system, you know where that comes from? That's the devil, the prince of the power of the air. So what Henry Morris is saying here is, you can't start compromising with the world system. And a lot of Christians are compromising with the world system because you're not even taking time to pass what you're seeing and what you're hearing through the grid of God's word to call it out for what it is. I, I'm, I'm going to venture, you know, 90% of the commercials that I can see on television, even when I'm watching the Andy Griffith show, for heaven's sake, are part of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Asking us to live like the Joneses live, to have what they have, to spend our time like the world spends its time, our money like the world spends its money, right? That's a compromise. That's what Abram was doing. Henry Morris, Christians who follow this path may easily interpret the prosperity that follows such a compromise as confirmation that this was, after all, God's leading. And they may become quite satisfied with the situation. Until that is, God finally has to deal with them in chastisement, forcing them out of the compromising position back into the walk of true faith. Could you be out of God's will for your life and making more money than you would if you were in God's will? Yeah, that could be. Could you be out of God's will for your life, teenagers, and be much more popular at school than you would be if you were following God's will? Yes, that could be. Right? Could you have the relationship that you want in your life and be out of God's will and feel more safe than you would? That, that could be for a season. All right? Just because you're prospering, just because you're getting what you think you want, listen to me, does not mean you're in the Lord's will. This is why we weigh what we do against the word of God and not our emotions. This is why... When we care about teenagers and children, we teach them to read and love the Word of God. Because we can't always be there with them, can we? But the Word of God, I ha thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Okay? Compromise will not do. Genesis 12, 17. But the, look what happened. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Abram wasn't feeling too bad in his sin, but Pharaoh got afflicted because of Sarai. Okay? God delivered her. The Lord cares enough about us that even when we sin, see, Abram was altogether responsible for this because as the man, as a spiritual head, he is the one who brought this all to fruition. But of course, Sarai was complicit with the lie as well. All right. But the bottom line is, even when we sin, God provides a way of deliverance. I should be hearing a lot of hallelujahs out there right now. That is grace. And it is in the Old Testament. I feel led to turn to a scripture that I didn't have planned to turn to. I'm going to do it right now. I want you all to listen to this. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Okay? God always provides a way of deliverance or a way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. If you struggle with temptation, if you're struggling in circumstances and you're afraid to make the hard choices you know to make to quit compromising with the world, 
You're afraid of the financial consequences, the relationship consequences, the popularity consequences, whatever it is. Ready? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. This is the word of God. I'm not making this up, right? You might say, well, you don't understand my circumstances. My temptation, my problem, my sin, I'm kind of stuck. Nobody else has ever been through this before. Right? I feel like at times, but are you ready for this? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to humanity. Did you hear that? God says there's not a temptation that you could ever have. No matter how crazy you think it is, no matter if you think you're the only one, somebody else has been through that temptation. It's actually common to humanity. Ready for this? God is faithful. It doesn't say Shelley is faithful. It doesn't say Taya is faithful. It doesn't say John is faithful. It says God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Which means Abram didn't have to lie. God didn't let Abram and Sarai be tempted above what they were able to handle, right? But God will, with the temptation, also provide a way to escape that you may be able to endure it. That is some good preaching right there, right? So hear me out. There's always a way of escape. You're not going through something that nobody else has ever been through, even if people won't talk about it. There is no excuse, and it's not because you're faithful. It's because God is faithful, and he'll make a way for you to escape. Yeah, so I'm getting a few, right? When you preach hard like that, sometimes the, the wows go down. <laughs> but that's okay. That's the Holy Spirit working. The Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues. Matthew Henry said this. I love this. God chastised Pharaoh... And so prevented the progress of his sin. Note, those are happy chastisements or punishments that hinder us in a sinful way and effectually bring us to our duty and particularly to the duty of restoring that which we have wrongfully taken and detained. So in layman's terms, what this is saying is, if you're in sin, and God begins to discipline you and chastise you, you ought to consider yourself a very blessed person because he is stopping you from going any further. Now, I could pause right here and say, if God did not stop this from going any further, I want you to think about the implications of something. It reminds me of Peter and his great sin when Jesus said, I'm about to go to the cross, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be raised to life, and Peter grabbed a hold of Jesus and rebuked him, can you imagine, telling the Son of God, this shall never happen to you. Now, I understand Peter's emotion there and his love for the Lord. I get all that. But I want to tell you, if Peter had gotten his wish, Jesus would have never died on the cross. How many of you, th how many of you are glad that Peter did not get what he wanted? Oh, but everything we want is right. <laughs> you know, Petey, he was way off base, but everything I... No, if God always gave you what you wanted, you'd be in big trouble. So... This reminds me of that. I want you to think about what would have happened here. If this would have gone on and Pharaoh would have taken her as his wife, how would God have ever brought the Jewish nation into existence through the seed of Abraham? Gone. The whole thing wiped out. The whole thing wiped out with one sin. Just like the crucifixion of Jesus would have been wiped out if Peter's wish would have come true. Sin has consequences. How we should repent, how we should regret, how we should strive to not sin against God. Because sometimes we know what the consequences are and sometimes we don't even see the whole thing. Right? Henry Morris wanted to say Abram's compromise seemed to be working out very well. Sarai was still safe. 
And he himself not only was alive, but he was prospering. But what would happen when Pharaoh actually decided to take Sarai as his wife? And as I just said, what would have happened is the whole promise of God to bless every nation through Abraham would have been because the plan of God was for Abraham and Sarai. And if you remember, Abraham went on later by lack of faith to have sexual relationship with his, his servant, Hagar, and then they had the son Ishmael, and Ishmael and his progeny have been fighting with Isaac and his progeny since that day. Sin is always going to lead to problems. It had been God's intention to bring the promised seed into the world through Abram and Sarai. And this development would certainly prevent that from happening. But what could they do now? How many of you have ever been in that position? What, what can I do now? The mess is already too big. I've already gone too far. Here's a question. Have you ever gone so far that God cannot rescue you? The answer is... No, you never have. God can rescue you. Tonight, the Holy Spirit wants to encourage. You may, you, know, you may think, well, nobody on here would ever think me. I've been a Christian so long. I don't need to hear it. And, and inside you're thinking, I do need to hear this. Yes. Okay, listen. You're never too far gone that God cannot rescue you. You may have been a Christian 60 years and you're caught in some addiction or sin or stronghold. God can rescue you, my friend. Amen. They themselves were helpless to change the situation. God was not helpless. God's never helpless. Job 42.2. If you don't know this scripture, please highlight it in your Bible. Please underline it in your Bible. The very first book, I've written three books, and the very first book that I ever wrote, Real Life, Real God, Real Hope, the first devotion in that book is called With a Single Breath. I'll never forget it. It's a devotion based on this scripture. That with a single breath of God, he can turn everything completely around and do miracles. Right? Job 42.2 I know that you, God, can do all things and that no purpose of yours can ever be thwarted. How many of you out there know that not even Hitler thwarted the plan of God? How many of you know that you and your sinfulness have not thwarted the plan of God? How many of you know that God's plan is bigger than your plan? Amen? Nothing can thwart the plan of God. God can do all things. So because of Sarai, Abram's life, Pharaoh gets hit with plagues. How, now, here's a, here's a point. How Pharaoh found out the reason for the plagues, we do not know. Perhaps God spoke to Pharaoh, or maybe Pharaoh spoke with Lot or one of Abram's servants and said, hey, this is going on. Do you have any idea why? Or maybe God just came to Pharaoh and told him. The narrative just doesn't explain it. If God were to put every conversation and every detail in this book, we would, you know, I, I, is John. At the end of John's gospel, John says something to the effect of, Jesus did many other things when he walked the earth. And John said, you know, if I were to record every one of them, there would be so many books they'd fill the whole world, right? So he can't put every detail, but somehow Pharaoh knew. So in verses 18 and 19, here's what happens now. Pharaoh called Abram. Now, I want you to imagine this. Wait a second. We're talking about Pharaoh, right? Godless, pagan ruler. Pharaoh called Abram. I know they didn't have phones back then. You know, he's, he's texting Abram. Hey, get over here. I need to see you. He's calling Abram, okay? Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you've done to me? Just stop right there. The most godless and evil of the godless and evil calls God's man and says, what have you done to me? How pathetic is that? Pharaoh is going to help direct Abram? Yeah? 
That's how low a child of God can sink when we yield to sin. So if, you, if you've ever had this feeling, oh, I'm saved, I'm covered by God's grace, so I'll do whatever I want to do. And I, Listen to me. You may be saved, but you may do untold damage to the name of Jesus Christ. What have you done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Pharaoh's calling on Abram on a lie. Why did you say, and he, he nails it, he knows exactly what Abram did here. Why did you twist the truth? Why did you say she is my sister? So that I took her for my wife. Now then, here is your wife, take her and go. Now the good news in all this is, because what I'm going to show you in a second here is, the progression uh, of things as to how a woman would become part of Pharaoh's harem, Pharaoh most likely, I mean, we're not told this directly in the, bottom, in the Bible, but it's pretty, it's implicated, that Pharaoh never did commit sexual sin with Sarai. She was put out of the situation before uh, that part of, of this happened. But can you imagine the confrontation here? I took her for my wife, J. Vernon McGee. Here's what he said. We know from the book of Esther, how many of you know about the book of Esther, Queen Esther, right? That in those days, there was a period of preparation for a woman to become a wife of a ruler. You didn't just all of a sudden get married and there you are, right? There was preparation. You had to be doctored up. You had to be trained. Oh my goodness. Okay. And during that period of preparation, God plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues and let him know that he was not to take Sarai as his wife. So God stopped it in time. Who's thankful for that? So that Sarai wasn't defiled. What is this you've done to me? The godless man says. And I wrote in my notes, how incredible that a godless man had to call out the sin of a godly man. We got way too much of that going on today. On a small scale and on a large scale, we got way too much of the media and, and, and many people who have nothing to do with God, don't care about God at all, are having to report on and call out the sins of the godly. We are going to sin. None of us is perfect. We all are going to sin. But God, help us to take this seriously. God, help us to battle sin and to understand the consequences. Yes, you may still go to heaven, but you can lose a ton of reward. You can lose a ton of influence in this world. You can, you can lose your testimony. It's rough. Serious business. John MacArthur said about this. Abram's lack of faith also placed Pharaoh and his household in jeopardy. It's a principle of sin that one man's sin will often endanger many other people. What's worse, Pharaoh had not done anything to threaten Abram. Indeed, he had been generous in giving Abram gifts. This is what kills me too. The Christian in this case did wrong to the non-Christian and the non-Christian did well to the Christian. Now that does not negate Christianity. Uh, you know, even in today's world, people often say, oh, I know non-Christians who are kinder than Christians are. Yeah, that's true. Because nobody is perfect. We are all humans. But that does not negate Christianity. Because I'll tell you something. Being nice, being kind, and doing good does not get you to heaven. The Christian is still saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and trusting in Jesus Christ. So this doesn't mean that Pharaoh was a godly man. It's just to point out that when Christians go the way of the world and the way of sin... You're just right back in the mire and the mud of sin. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. I don't know what tone Pharaoh had at that time. I don't know what his facial expression was like, what his you know, body language was like, but he had to be livid angry that someone he had trusted, someone who he probably knew was claiming to be of God, had lied to him, put him at great risk, and cause sickness in his household. John Calvin, 
God, on behalf of his servant, interposed his mighty hand in time, lest Sarai should be violated. Here we have a remarkable instance of the careful concern with which God protects his servants by undertaking their cause against the most powerful monarchs. Pharaoh was the most powerful man in Egypt, right? A world ruler at that time. He could have easily done whatever he wanted to do, by the way, with Sarai, even if she was Abram's wife, except that God got involved and sent the plagues. Pharaoh could have done whatever he wanted to Abram after he found out what Abram did to him. But God intervened. Can I get an amen out there? Praise God, we don't always have to suffer all the consequences that we would have. Even when it comes to powerful people, and I want to pause here and say there are a lot of people who are upset about leadership in the world today, leadership in the United States of America, leadership on a local level, all kinds of stuff. We get all worried about the rulers and the powers. Watch this. <clears throat> Psalm 105, 12 to 15. Speaking of the Israelites, watch this. Because you can, you can just think of this as applying to Christians. When they were few in number, okay, when the Israelites were very few and of little account, they were weak, they didn't have much. When God's people were sojourners in the land, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people, even when they were nothing and just wandering around and had nothing and no influence, he allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, touch not my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. That's a beautiful scripture. God is going to have his will be done. And as long as you are called by God, he will protect you. It doesn't matter what the more powerful people above you do. Hallelujah. Are there days when I wonder what in the world's going to go on, right? Yes, there are days. But then God says to me, Shelly, you, as my friend Barbara always loved to say to me, and I love when she still says it, preach it, sister. Go ahead and preach it, right? Because as long as God wants me to preach, I'll preach. Amen? And as long as God wants you to influence and do what you're doing, he will let you do it. And this is why I've never backed away. It's just my personal opinion on this. I've never backed away from social media platforms. I've never backed away from the darkness. I'm going into the darkness and pushing forth the light. Because if God's giving me his leading and his protection, and when he takes it away, then that door is closed, and then that's over, and that's God's will. Hallelujah. Praise God for what he's done. I praise God for what he's done with Hope and Passion Ministries and opening up these avenues to preach his word, to have more people here, young people, old people, people in between, right? Even if you have a favorite pet, your, your cat, your dog, you know, you want them to be a Christian, have them listen, right? Have them listen. May we remember that we are covered, John Calvin said, by God's protection in order that the violence of those who are more powerful may not oppress us. Let's live with some courage, Christians. Let's quit complaining. Let's quit running away. Let's quit uh, just, I, I just, the word complain, just complaining and murmuring about everything. Live with some power. Live with the power of the Holy Spirit and know God is protecting you. All right, I'm starting to spit. There's spit coming out of my mouth, right? Yeah. Oh boy, what was, I think, what was that technical department where this little? Cat prays with me. Oh. Cat prays with me. Oh, the cat. Okay, somebody's talking about their cat prays with them. <laughs> hey, I believe God uses animal. He used Balaam. He talked through Bala uh, Balaam's donkey, right? But I do believe God cares about our animals and, you know, hey, preach them the gospel, right? <laughs> okay, yes. All fish, yeah. All, everything's included. God's, if you read Romans chapter 8, God is redeeming all of creation. Animals are important to the Lord. That's exciting stuff. 
Genesis 12, 20. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Look at that. God even gave him all that he had. John Calvin, indeed, one can almost hear Pharaoh turn to his courtiers and as Abram and Sarah slunk away down the audience chamber. And you can almost hear Pharaoh saying this, well, if that's an example of a believer, may I never meet another one. I've got to be honest with you guys. I've studied the Bible for many, many years. Never as intensely in Genesis as this. Did you ever realize that this narrative had so much in it? Did you ever think about the details, the real life implications of this? Did you ever think about Pharaoh saying that, looking at his buddies as he's watching Abram and Sarai go and thinking, man, if that's what a person of God looks like, I don't want anything to do with that. And you know, people sometimes think I'm crazy, but I, I like to preach a lot about lack of passion, lukewarm Christians. And Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3 that he wants to spit, actual the Greek word is vomit lukewarm Christians out of his mouth. Jesus actually said in Revelation chapter 3 that I would rather have someone be hot or cold. Jesus said, but the one thing that nauseates me that I'm going to throw completely away from myself is a lukewarm person. And this is one of the reasons, because Abram was acting in a lukewarm fashion here, right? He wasn't being passionate for God. And in doing so, what he was doing was making the, the, the world around him that didn't know God, making them feel like if that's what serving God is about, I don't want anything to do with it. It's an absolute turn off. It's anti-gospel to live in a sinful, lukewarm fashion. We got to live in such a way, not that people think we're perfect, that's not what I'm getting at, but to live in such a way that we're going after God in such a way that people are looking at us and saying, now if that's what it means to be a Christian, man, that's something else. I want that kind of passion for the God of, 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 of the entire world, okay? So the damage that is done when we back away from God and compromise with the world and begin to live in a lukewarm way, John Calvin said how important it is that we guard our testimony well, that we never by word or deed or implication so behave that we misrepresent our Lord to the world. So I think it was yesterday on, on Facebook I was led to this scripture and I posted, I saw a lot of you like this one. I want you to think about this from the New Living Translation, 1 Peter 2.12. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. You know, I think of this just in the simplest of terms. Uh, I, before the pandemic, it was even more so, but I like to go to restaurants and study and work. I like to sometimes meet people there and talk and have conversations and sometimes friends, sometimes my family. And I, I can think back to times when I've been in my Irwin Wendy's restaurant and, and maybe myself and a family member or two of mine got into a little argument, you know, and... Yeah, maybe I raised my voice and maybe, maybe I have a temper. I don't know. Maybe I do. All right. But anyway, yeah. And so when I go back and I think about that and think of all the people that were there and how the conversation probably, I mean, if you talk to me for very long, I usually end up talking something about God, the Bible, you know, and then I'm mixing in anger and, and disrespect and heaven forbid we're caught gossiping and then you think about what the people who are paying attention are seeing and how I'm ruining God's name by what I'm doing as his representative and my prayer always is I, I love it I've it, being caught red-handed doing the right thing you know I love being in a restaurant um, technical department and I finally got a chance to go actually have a single with cheese together okay and a wendy's iced tea and it was the most glorious time because she asked me a particular question and her questions aren't that complicated just 
Could you explain the history of the whole world as it parallels to uh, how God took his people from Abraham to the millennial reign of Christ? All right, no, 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 no big deal. So I got out a bunch of napkins at Wendy's. I said, do you have a pen? And I'm sitting there and, you know, I'm explaining to Bria. Well, and, and I didn't even know if my brain could handle it, if I could really trace world history that far from Abraham to the millennium. But somehow we did, you know. And we're sitting there talking, and I have my Bible, and I'm scribbling on these napkins, and I mean, I don't know how many different kind of words are coming out, you know, the book of Daniel, uh, the revelation, millennial reign of Jesus Christ, salvation, God's people, the Jews, uh, Israel, Jerusalem, you know, all, we're, we're just, all these words, and there's people all around us. And, and when, I, when I'm talking about Jesus, listen, I kind of lose a sense of myself, but I'm telling you, I'm sure that there were people watching, seeing the Bible, hearing what you're we saying. And I thought, this is the way I want to be caught. And then I was in the entrance to Coles, walking into Coles one evening, and I saw someone who used to come to the Bible study, and, and we kind of met in the foyer there. And the next thing you know, I, here's me, I'm going like this, and I'm talking about, that's why preachers need to preach the Word of God, word for word, because this is what, you know, and I'm going on and on, and someone that knows me comes walking through. And I think to myself, good. Catch me talking about Jesus. Let someone catch us with our Bibles open, acting like our hope is in the Word of God, acting like our excitement and our passion and our love is Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen? And, and when I put this up on Facebook, I think it was Kathy, my friend Kathy that lives Louisiana, right? Down south, okay? She said, this also applies to social media. This also applies to Facebook. Watch what you say. Watch what image you put out. Amen? Listen, I know time's up, but this has been, whoo! How many of you have enjoyed this tonight? I, I don't even feel like this has been a Bible study. I feel like this has been a, an evangelistic service. Like are we, we're, I feel like I'm preaching here. But I've had so much fun, and I thank you for listening. I want to pray for you. Do not tune out. I want to pray for you. I also want to give you this announcement. I know this is a sad announcement for us, but it actually, the Lord has, in, in, in my drawing this boundary, God has really blessed me. He gives me a season of a little bit of rest. I, I just want to tell you, when we ask you to give to Hope and Passion Ministries, you know, some of you saw I posted to Facebook today that I was at Panera studying and working on one of my upcoming revelation messages. And I'll tell you, it was hard today. I, I, it was, I was struggling. And there are days I just got to plow through it uh, because it's hours and hours and hours and hours of study and preparation. But, you know, that's what we're about. I want to know God's word and to preach God's word. And, and, and anyway, the amount of hours that it takes for me to study... I, I have to study, I have to pray, I have to research, I have to design the PowerPoints, I have to write my daily emails, my social media posts, and speak in other places, everything that I do to do a full hour on Sunday and a full hour on a Tuesday and a daily devotion is more in terms of preaching than a lot of pastors do. So I gotta tell you something. God spoke to me and said, you make Bible study the first three Tuesdays of every month and no more because you need that rest. I miss you and I miss doing it, but God knows that I need that, right? I need that. I also continue to manage my type 1 diabetes and it's just a good rest period. So what I'm trying to say to you is invest in hope and passion it takes a lot of hours, a lot of work for us to do this. This is my full-time work. And also, our next Bible study will be, I have a note over there, will be April 6th, okay? The next Tuesday Bible study will be the first Tuesday in April, April 6th. That'll be right after our communion service. So I pray that you'll join us. And I pray that you'll be joining us Sunday morning for the Revelation series. Here's the good news. If you get on my YouTube channel, the technical department, despite some snafus that they do sometimes, organized our face our uh, youtube channel into playlists so you can click up click on the playlist tab and it'll show you all the revelation in a row right or all the genesis in a row and a thanks to an old high school friend of mine who suggested that my friend andy haven't seen him since high school and somehow he caught me 
preaching God's word and suggested that. And uh, I do want to say great thank you. I know lots of you do to my technical department. Bria is incredible, but she's not only the technical department. She is also the financial department, the donation reception processing department. She is the website designer and upkeeper. She is the YouTube and sermon downloader. She's uh, everything else. Everything that I'm not doing, that's what she's doing. And the only thing I do is preach, okay, and study. So um, we're grateful for that. I want to pray for you, right? This has been a wild time tonight, but I think the Holy Spirit's done some awesome things. So, Lord, the seeds that you planted tonight, the things that you wanted to say, that you emphasized, I pray continue to settle in people's souls and that those seeds would grow to fruition, that righteousness would grow, that testimony and witnessing for you would grow, that passion for you would grow, that lukewarmness and sinfulness would be diminished. And Father, we would be people who carry the light of Jesus Christ and make a difference for people's eternities. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done this evening. Bless everyone who has watched. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. See you Sunday morning at 10 a.m. and the next Bible study, April 6th. God bless you.